Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and this is going to be one of the funnest videos I've ever done. I love it when one person is right and the world is wrong, and I get to bet on the right guy. So I bet that David Roll, in a test of time, has found evidence for the Bible stories for a united monarchy that no other archaeologists have ever been able to find. A few basics before we get started. The different ages, Iron Age, Late Bronze, Middle Bronze, Early Bronze, are identified by the pottery, the dishes, that are found at those levels. So if you find Late Bronze pottery at this level, you figure, okay, that's the Late Bronze era. And that's how they can tell which ages are in existence at the time. Now, when you talk about these cities and towns and these wars going on, just think of every town or city as a fortified ranch because they do agriculture, but they're a fortified ranch with hired guns and they try and take over each other's ranches. Okay. Now, for the language, now the Egyptian S in Hebrew is a sh. So you have salam, you have shalom. So just remember this interchangeable between uh, Egyptian and Hebrew. The Egyptian J is, in Hebrew, a Y. So, Jesse is actually Yeshe. Now, uh, the English Z in Hebrew is a Tz. So, Hazor is Hatzor. Vowels aren't used. So, Shoshank is also called Shishank. And it could have also been called Shishank. So, now we go into the timeline for Israel. I've done this up to explain it. These are good, exact dates. Here's how we know. Up here, we had the uh, sacking of Thebes. And that's a well-known date accepted by everybody. And they knew the names of the kings of Israel and Judah at the time. And so, they know the length of their reigns. And they can tell when they broke apart. So, Israel and Judah broke apart in 925, five years after Solomon died, and 40 years after David died, and 40 years after Saul died. So these dates are verified, and we're using them. So Saul started in 1050, and he got killed in 1010. And then David was a king, and he ended up dying in 970. And Solomon, well, he ended up reigning 40 years till 930. And then five years, and then they split up into two uh, nations. And then five years later, Shishak came and raided and plundered Jerusalem. I mean, that's right. So, this information comes from A Test of Time by David Roll. Okay? And if you want the backing it's all in there but i'm just going to be pointing out the coincidences that he raised in one hopefully effective um analysis so that we can determine the odds of whether the bible stories are true so the timeline you've got now number one in samuel one samuel they talk about the first king of israel shawl saul um, and it means asked for now, asked for probably wasn't the name he was born with. It was a name they gave him to him after he was asked for because they said the 12 tribes of Israel, we're tired of being independent and alone. We want to have one king who can deal with the outside world. And so the prophet Samuel said, okay, I'm picking Saul. You asked for him, you got him. Now, Saul said, hey, why are you telling me? What do I know about foreign affairs and, and correspondence with other nations? Why are you making me king? Ah, Samuel says, doesn't matter. You're going to be it. Now, Saul had a bodyguards called Great Lions. Because in Psalm, you had David. They were chasing David. And he says, I'm in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows. Whose tongues are sharp swords. So... Saul had his great lions as his bodyguards chasing David, eventually. He came from the smallest clan, Benjamin. He was a newbie. And in, uh, later on, he 
they tell him, Samuel says, stop at the shrine on your way home to Gibeah, and I want you to go see what's going to happen there. Then later on, the Philistines invade. They take over his hometown and capture the shrine, of course. And um, then Jonathan and Saul take it back. They knocked down the Philistine marker of, you know, it's your ours, and they took him back. So what's interesting is that Saul's expansion goes right up to the Jezreel Valley, you know, and it's around the Jebusite Jerusalem. They never took Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And the Canaanite Gezer, they never took Gezer. So Saul basically expanded all the way north to Megiddo. Now the major cities at his time were Akko, Ijalon, Ashkelon, Bethshan, Gath, Gaza, Gezer, Hatzor, Jerusalem, Lashish, Megiddo, and Tanakh. So, Anyway, David kills Goliath and marries Saul's daughter, son-in-law. Jonathan warns David that Saul's jealous of all the people who, you know, think you're great and uh, you better get out of here. So he escapes from Saul's great lines and uh, becomes a mercenary outlaw gang with 600 people outlaws in his gang. Now, Jonathan is con accused of consorting with David, where Saul says, I know you're hanging out with... David, and as long as he's alive, your rights as king are in danger. Okay? So we know that part of the Jonathan story. And then David takes off to the king of Gath, called Ashish, which might be Aki Shemesh. Shemesh is the sun god, and Aki Shemesh is sun god has given, and that could be Akish, a short for sun god has given. And he works for the king of Gath with the Philistines. But here comes now the fight with Saul, and they arm, they, um, so they go into the Jezreel Valley and they t leave David behind. Say, we don't trust you guys because you're connected to the tribes. And so the Philistines go and beat Saul at the Jezreel Valley, but they don't take him alive, okay, at Gilboa, where he's killed. And then the Philistines occupy the towns of Jezreel, and Saul's body is hung on the walls of Beth Shan. Now, in Samuel 2, we hear about, first of all, we know that Saul had two sons left. He had Ishbal, the other ones were all killed at Gilboa, um, who's the king of the 11 tribes. And you got son-in-law David, who is the king at Hebron of Judah, one tribe. Now, son Ishbal means man of Baal. Now, why would Saul have named, uh, you know, he's for Yahweh, right? Why would Saul have named a son, man of Baal, another god? Well, I'm figuring maybe he was just covering. Maybe he had another guy named Ish Yahweh or Ish Moloch or Ish Shemij, you know, man of all sorts of gods, just in case. Who knows which one's right? But still, man of Baal is his son's name. Now, Now we have David's lament, where he talks about Saul's shield defiled. Well, what does that mean? Saul didn't do anything chicken. He died a warrior's honorable death. What does he mean by Saul's shield's been defiled? Hmm. Now the cast of characters are, in 2 Samuel, David, his general Yoab from Ashtaroth, that's important, Yishai, his father, Jesse, Ishbal, son of Saul, and General Banna for Ishbal. Now, Ishbal slays, is slain by Banna, and David becomes king of all 12 tribes. Now, David's outlaws capture the mountain fortress of Zion. He's now ruling the 12 tribes from Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And David chased, and then the Philistines face Zion in the valley of Rephaim, Manahath, it's called. Then David chases them down all the way down to the gates of Gezer when he beats them, but doesn't take Gezer. And finally, we hear about his enemy, Hadad Ezer from Aram Zobah, who he fought with. This was a Syrian guy, and his expansion was to the north. But David seized a lot of his stuff to the south. So that was Hadad Ezer. And David kills his general, Shobak. 
So remember that. Now Solomon, his turn. Now Solomon's riches, he really was the richest banker on earth. Now at that in those days, you were getting 20% interest on money, 33% interest on grain, through most of old ancient history. And that meant that your money doubled every three and a half years. So in 40 years, your money would double 11 times, which is a factor of 2,000. So whatever Solomon started with from David and the crew, you could sit there and expect it to draw in 2,000 times more than they started with at 20% interest over 40 years. Now, he was the central banker, and everybody was depositing their gold with him anyway. So, yeah, of course, he was going to end up owning it all. But let's say the king of Mitanni had to pay something to the king of Babylon. He'd just say, hey, Saul, would you transfer 10 talents of gold from my account to his Send him the gold? No, he didn't have to. He just had to transfer it to his account and change the number for the king of Babylon. So Solomon was banker for the world, and he was holding the world's gold. But what did he start with? Well, they say in uh, Chronicles that David left him 3,000 talents of gold, and the rest of the crew tried, left them 5,000 more. 8,000 talents. Now, a talent is 60 pounds, okay? So that means that after 40 years, they'd end up with 16 million talents. Now, that's 500,000 tons, all right? That's a lot of gold. Now, it's not that big. It's about, you know, 25 meters cube, okay? But it's still, gold weighs heavy. One cubic foot of water weighs so much, a cubic foot of gold weighs 20 times more, about. So yeah, it's really heavy stuff. And uh, you know, don't need that big of a block to have 500,000 tons. But anyway, Saul had that kind of gold. He had, was holding the world's gold. He was the central banker for the world. Everybody owed Saul money because they all borrowed from Saul at 20%, right? So, now, he built himself a palace. Well, actually, David did that one. And a throne and a temple. He had a throne, an interesting throne. He built a temple and the Milo. And he built, he built up Ge Gezer, Hatzor, and Megiddo. These big towns were built up. And he built these huge gates there. Now, guess what? Solomon's throne had lions at each side, it says. And he married an Egyptian princess. And then he moved her up to a palace higher up on the hill. Then Solomon dies and Rehoboam of Judah and Jeroboam of Israel split up. Oh, they had a fight over forced labor and interest rates. And, uh, you know, Israel says, we're going our way, you go yours. Now, anyway, the split happens. Now, Rehoboam fortifies 15 cities, okay, with his... 1400 chariots and all his horsemen and uh, but these are to the south between Egypt for some reason and but Shishak comes and plunders them all anyway and that date was set as 925 so here is the Egyptian chronology beside it here's how that works so they say that in 925 Shishank over here, or Shoshank, or whatever, is Shishak, the pharaoh who invaded and plundered Solomon's temple. Okay, so Egyptian chronology is tied to Shoshank being Shishak. Now, below that, you've got the 21st dynasty and the 20th dynasty. Shoshank was the 22nd. And below them, you've got the 19th, which is Ramses, and the 18th, which is Flaky Akhenaten, and we'll come back to them later. So, Shoshank is the guy who pegs the Egyptian chronology to 925. Now, the Armana letters, they happened 350 years earlier. Okay, Remember, I'm going to break this out now. You have... Ramses, Akhenaten, and then earlier. So this block 
this block here called the New Kingdom is pretty certain data, okay? It's 360 years long, and uh, those are the guys in the list, all right? Ramses and Akhenaten. So Akhenaten is 350 years behind Saul, okay, before Saul. And that is where we are right now. And they found these Armana letters, which were the correspondence between Akhenaten's court in Egypt and all of the plantations and ranches in Canaan. And they had this problem with these outlaws called Habiru. And in old times, they were called Apiru. And they were people who didn't belong to one of the ranches. And they hired themselves out as hired guns. Okay, and uh, they were mercenaries. So, now the years I gave you. So, Akhenaten supposedly started 350 years before Saul. All right. Now, remember the line number one. The first king of Israel, Saul, is asked for, and his bodyguards are the great lions. Lebayim. Well, Labayu means great lion. Whoa, what a coincidence that 350 years earlier, the guy who's running the area is called Great Lion, and then now you got you had Saul, whose bodyguards were Great Lions. What a fluke. Interesting. Number two. Now, Labayu was also from that the Benjamin area, and uh, Geba of Benjamin, I believe, was his town. And William Albright noted Labayu's beginnings were insignificant. From his scribes so untutored, he wrote an almost pure Canaanite, not knowing Akkadian. So Labayu's scribe didn't even know the foreign correspondence language to talk to Pharaoh's court, and he wrote in his own. He called Canaanite. So that means that this is a newbie to international affairs, just like Saul. So Labayu's just like Saul. Number three. Now, remember that uh, Saul had to stop at the shrine before he got to his home, and then they raided his home, and then he took it back. Well, in letter number 252, you have the story about Labayu complaining to the Pharaoh, hey, they're bad-mouthing me. These guys, I signed a truce. These guys took my town and my God, and I came and I took it back. I got a right to hold them hostage. Okay, but I won't let anybody kill him. So that's Labayu writing to Pharaoh about having lost his hometown and his god and having taken it back. Fascinating parallel, right? Now, remember, they take it back and he took it back. Now, Saul's expansion went all the way up to the Jezreel and around Jerusalem and Gezer. Labayu's expansion went all the way up to the Jezreel at Megiddo and went around Jerusalem and Gezer too. Same major cities were still existing then as 350 years later. Akko, Ijalon, Ashkelon, Bethlehem, Gath, Gaza, Gezer, Hatzor, Jerusalem, Lashish, Megiddo, and Tanach. All still existing or were existing 350 years earlier. Usually some are burned out, you know, So, but they were all there. Now, remember, David basically leads the first mercenary outlaw gang in the Bible. And... In the uh, Armana letters, they're talking about the Habiru, mercenaries, and we've had commentators say, boy, David's mercenaries look just like the mercenaries from the Habiru days 350 years earlier. Yeah, you're right, because the Israelis were never mercenaries before David had to be. Wow! Now, remember Jonathan consorting with outlaw David? Well, in letter 254, Labayu says to Pharaoh, Hey, I didn't know my son was consorting with the Habiru outlaws. Here, I'm handing them over to Idaiah. You check them out. Wow, what a parallel. So Labayu's son was consorting with the outlaws, just like Jonathan was consorting with David. Whoa, what a fluke. Now, Remember the king Ashish of Gath, son has given? Well, the Gath king in the time of Labayu was Shwardada in Akkadian, which means the son has given. What a fluke! Saul is fighting with a guy led by Gath named the son has given, and Labayu is fighting with a guy from Gath named the son has given. Whoa, what a coincidence! 
Now, remember, the Philistines don't take Saul alive at Gilboa, all right? He falls on his sword. Well, in letter 255, Beridia of Megiddo in the Jezreel reports Labayu was not taken alive. Oh, so Saul wasn't taken alive and Labayu wasn't taken alive. And then, remember, the Gath Philistine army occupies the Jezreel Valley and hangs Saul's body on the walls of Beth Shan. Well, in letter 289, Labayu Fo, Fo Abdehida of Jerusalem says, Hey, the Gath troops to my southwest are now occupying Beth Shan to my northeast. Whoa, what a coincidence that he's complaining about troops from Gath at Beth Shan as Saul's killers from Gath take Beth Shan and stick his body on the wall. What a coincidence. Finally, the best one. In, in letter 252, Labayu, when he's talking about, you know, hey, these guys took my city, I took it back. He said, look, if an ant is struck, does it not fight back and bite the hand of the man that struck it? Well, William Albright also noted Labayu had used the Hebrew word nemala for ant, whereas one would have expected Akkadian zilbabu. His scribe wrote in almost pure Canaanite, remember he said that, not knowing Akkadian. Well, Olibright qualified the Hebrew word as Canaanite because Hebrew didn't exist for another 350 years. So what are the odds that Labayu would use a Hebrew word before there was a Hebrew language? Wow, what a coincidence. Now, Samuel 2, that's a story of, remember, Saul's two sons, Ishbal and David, son-in-law. Well, that's when the Armana letters start talking about the two sons of Labayu making noise and fighting with the people. And then son Saul is named Ishbal. Remember that, man of all? And guess what? Labayu's son is named Mutbal, man of ball. Wow, what a coincidence. Saul's son is named man of ball, and Labayu's son is named man of ball. What a coincidence. So, remember David's lament about the shield being defiled? Guess what? In letter 250, Balu Ursag from an unknown town says, Hey, the two sons of Labayu are complaining that the people of Gina killed our father. Whoa! The people of Gina killed their father? Where's Gina? Gina's at Gilboa! Wow! Saul dies at Gilboa, and Labayu dies at Gilboa. What a fluke! Now, by shield being defiled, and by hearing that the people of Gina killed him, they didn't say Philistines, they said the people of Gina, shield being defiled, it kind of sounds like his protection broke down. You see, the people of Gina are on the south slope of the mountain with an easy slope rise. And here is Saul on the front slope of the mountain, which is steep because he doesn't want to be chased by chariots. Now, the people of Gina might have had to have his back. And if they didn't, and they let the Philistine archers to the top of the hills so they could shoot down at the, uh, at the Israelites, wow, that would mean that his shield was defiled. Some dirty stuff happened to end up with Saul being dead. And now you get the two sons of Labayu complaining about the people living at Gilboa who are responsible for the death of their father. Wow, another great coincidence. <laughs> so, now, remember the cast of characters. You had... David is General Yoab from Ashtaroth, Yishai Ishbal, and his General Dana. Well, in letter 256, Mudbal, Labayu's son, man of Baal, says to the Pharaoh, Hey, I ain't hiding Ahab from Ashtaroth, the mayor of Ashtaroth. I'm not hiding him. Why don't you ask Yeshua, Benina, and Tadua? Well, guess what? You've got, of course, 
Jesse would know Yoab, David's general, because Jesse's David's father. And uh, David would know Yoab, and he would know where he would be too. So who else to ask if you want to know where Yoab is than Jesse and David, and also throw in Banner, my general. I'm not hiding Ahab from Ashtaroth at my place. Wow! So, those are another set of coincidences in one letter where son of Nabayu, Mutbal, like son of Saul, Ishbal, you know, is talking about Ahab from Ashtaroth, like you got Yoab from Ashtaroth, and he's saying, ask Yeshua, okay? who is Yishe, David's father, and Banna, who is Benenima, the uh, guy in the uh, letters, and uh, finally Tajua, David. Mire. So the real name of David is probably Tajua, because he's mentioned by Labayu's son in Ishbal, I mean Matbal, in that letter. Isn't that neat? So, now, David's outlaws capture the mountain fortress of Zion. Zion. Well, guess what? After a while, you have complaints in letters 298, 284, and 306 from Yapahu of Gezer, from Shwardada of Gath, who's now on the run, and Shubandu somewhere. And they all say, look at our enemy from the mountains. Chiana is at war with us. So the mountain fortress is Chiana. The Habiru mountain fortress of the outlaws is Tiana, and David's mountain uh, outlaw fortress is Tian. Wow, what a fluke that the names would be so similar for the same capital of the Habiru and David's capital of the outlaws. Isn't that neat? So, next you have David beating the Philistines in the valley of Rephaim, Manahath. Guess what? In letter 292, Adadanu faces Tiana at Manhattu, M-N-H-T, same place, Manahath, Manahattu, or Manhath, Manhattu, whatever. It's not the vowels that are important, it's the consonants. It's the same place, and it chases them all the way down to the gates of Gezer. Same thing. The Philistines face them, right? And then Zion expands down to the gates of Gezer. But David doesn't take Gezer. And Adadanu from Gezer says that the Tianu Habiru have beaten him all the way back, but he will protect his town of Gezer. Whoa! So, same city, not taken. Then finally you got Hadadezer from Aram Zoba who expanded northward. David's, you know, enemy. Well, guess what? In the EAs, the... Uh, Armana letters, Aziru was the name of the Syrian in charge of that area, and Amuru, and his expansion went north to the same boundaries as Hadad Ezer's. Which means that what if his name was Hadad Aziru? Hadad being the storm god, the weather god. So, Aziru is very similar to Hadad Ezer in the expansion of his kingdom. Which, I, I love reading these reports where they all mention about, oh, look, this is copying what happened 350 years ago. Oh, look, Labayu's kingdom was the same as the Saul's. Oh, look, you know what I mean? It's enjoyable to catch these 350-year gaps. And then finally, David King killed the general Shopak. And in EA 170, the letter, Hadad Aziru notes he's got a general... Lupaku, which is, means man from Paku. <laughs> so isn't it funny that David's opponent would have a general from Paku, or that Hadid Aziru would note the general from uh, Paku. So anyway, both of them mentioned the guy from Paku. Isn't that neat? 350 years apart, that the guys fighting from the north are led by a general named from Paku. Solomon. Solomon's riches were not found in the Iron Age days. Such pickings were found in the late Bronze Age days with Ramses and Akhenaten. So Solomon 
built his palace, his lion throne, his temple, his Milo, and the gates of these towns. And Dame Kenyon dug a trench in Jerusalem, and she found nothing in the Iron Age. No big monuments, okay? They were all villages in the Iron Age. So the Iron Age had no big buildings. But in the late Bronze Age, she found Cut Rock Palace and Temple, a massive terrace, that's the Milo, and massive gates at Gezer and Hatzor and Megiddo. So you think those massive buildings were built in Jerusalem by the hillbilly Jebusites? Not a chance, okay? So, but still, isn't that fascinating that she couldn't find anything in the Iron Age, but found everything that fits in the Late Bronze Age? Whoa, neato. So, Solomon's throne had lions at each side. Well, guess what? One of the ivories found in the Late Bronze Age, this rich trove of, you know, wealth, had a picture of a king on a throne with sphinxes on the side. These are human-headed lions. So you got a picture of a king on the throne with lions on the side. Isn't that neat when Solomon was known to have a throne with lions on the side? Whoa, what a coincidence. Then, remember the Egyptian daughter he married and moved her up the city to her own place? Well, then they found in the late Bronze Age an Egyptian palace up the mountain on the way out to Sheshem. They found it, the Egyptian palace, and it's the only structure of its kind with Egyptian motifs ever found in Jerusalem. And then finally, Shishak plunders Judah's fortified cities in Jerusalem. That's Shishak who plunders the fortified cities and Jerusalem. Now, if you look at the Karnak murals, that show Iron Age Shoshank invaded Israel, not Judah. Shoshank can't be Shishak, since Iron Age Jerusalem had no temple or palace for Shoshank to plunder. You got that? So that couldn't be Shoshank then, but near Solomon at near Rehoboam. It had to be someone else. His war reliefs don't even mention taking Rehoboam's fifteen fortified cities on his list. Or the biggest gold heist in the history at Jerusalem. Doesn't even mention it. Shoshank's campaign took dozens of cities in northern Israel. Megiddo, Beth Shan, those kind of cities. So what's going on? Well, if you YouTube for a show called Flying Through History, Pharaoh Shishak One's Military Campaign in the Holy Land, one, oh yeah, uh, where they admit, they think he's Shoshank, but they, they admit, Scholars ask why Shoshank would attack General Boehm in Israel, his ally, right? You know, this remains a mystery to this day. Well, and they also mentioned copper smelting started two to three hundred years earlier than believed. Whoa, there's that number again. So, if look, at, if it started earlier, maybe Solomon was there, who knows? And activities mentioned in the Bible regarding Iron Age history might be pure myth. Well, yeah, but not late Bronze Age history. So, but didn't the Bible note a Pharaoh who conquered the cities of Israel and not Judah? You got Shoshank with this huge invasion of 60 towns through the Canaan, through northern Israel. What's going on? Didn't Israel notice that to put it in the book? Well, yeah, they did. In 2 Kings 13, they're talking about how the Arameans from Damascus were plundering the cities of Israel and taking them all over, okay? So that um, basically it was called the Aramean supremacy when the Aramean, King Hazel, was controlling all the cities of northern Israel. Then it says, but then King Jer um, Jehoahaz, you know, prayed to Yahweh and Yom sent a savior to set them free so they could live in their tents as before. Well, who do you think had the power to kick Hazio and the Arameans out of northern Israel? Well, you might think, would the Hittites have come from the south? Or could the Egyptians have come out from the north? Or would the Egyptians maybe have come from the south? Well, whose vassal would Jehoahaz probably have been? The Hittites or the Egyptians? Well, 
throughout the whole history, including Solomon and David and Israel was a vassal of Egypt. Even when Solomon was the richest guy around, ran the biggest ranch, he was still a vassal of Egypt, which is why they could just cut through to go north and fight with Kadesh and all that kind of stuff. So here we have now. Um, so this savior saved Israel from being oppressed. And guess what? That's Shoshank's campaign, why he went into northern Israel to kick out the Arameans. But that happened in 800, you know, 125 years later, which means that someone else has to be lowered down to be the Shishak. Now, who could that be? Well, now, Solomon shouldn't be looked for in the Shoshank Iron Age levels. He should be looked for in the late bronze Ramses age levels. And he's been found. So, at. So, Ramses the Great, Ramasheshi in Jewish, Shesha, SS, okay, did boast of plundering Jerusalem. The top corner store, the North Tower of the Ramesseum in Thebes, says the town which the king plundered in year eight, Shalem. Wow! So Ramses claimed to have plundered Shalem in year eight, his campaign in Canaan. Wow! On his way to Kadesh. And he's also the south wall at Abu Simbel has a mural of a fortress of the rebels on top of hills, giving up, no weapons, surrendering. Ramses accepted their surrender, plundered, didn't destroy the rebels who surrendered. After all, Saul's Egyptian wife might still have been there. Kin, right? <laughs> so, Shishak in Hebrew was Sisak in Egyptian. Ramesses in Egyptian was Rama Shisha in Hebrew. Shisha Sisa was a nickname for pharaohs named Ramses. No kidding, Sisa. So, now, the word Shashak in Hebrew means assaulter. So it's a good play of words if Shoshank could be changed to Shishak by dropping the N. Or Pharaoh Shisha could be made a Psalter by adding the K to Shisha, Shishak. So you can drop the N in Shoshank or you can add the K to Shisha. And that's how you can convert either one of the Pharaohs to be your assaulter. <laughs> but we know it's Ramses. So... Now, since none of the Bible stories are backed by Iron Age digs, but are backed by late bronze digs, if we drop Shoshank down later, around 800 to be savior, now let's take a look at our timeline again. Remember this? This is where he was, and Shoshank's here. But if we drop Shoshank down to here, we can drop this down. This is, whoa, over-exaggerated. These were concurrent, running together, split up. You can crush them down into the 22nd, and you can move the whole new kingdom down to here. As a matter of fact, this is what it should look like, the new kingdom, where it should be. So it was Ramses who invaded and took Rio. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this is the old one. And this is the new one. This is where Ramses should be. And Akhenaten should be there losing control of the colonies in the time of David and Saul. So, that is the new chronology that you can get if you do that. So, he drops down to being the savior. Shoshank drops down to being the savior of Israel from the Arameans in 800. And Ramses drops down to being the guy who plundered Shalem. Whoa! And that means that 80 years before that, you had all those stories in the Armana letters describing 80 years earlier, Saul and David. Wow! Suddenly, the two timelines mesh. So that's the neat thing about it. So, uh, now, since none of the Bible stories matches in the blink, if we drop him down and Ramesh is the new Shishak, if Jerusalem was just a hillbilly Jebusite fort at the time, with nothing much of value, why would Ramses mention it 
And what's to plunder in a dinky backwater town? Why mention Shalem at all and portray the surrendering rebel castle on the hill if it wasn't a big score? So Kadesh, in year eight, Ramses not only plundered Shalem, but he took Kadesh back after being beaten at the big fight earlier. He'd lost to the Hittites three years before. So I guess adding Solomon's 1,400 chariots to Shishak's 1,200 chariots and his 60,000 horsemen may have made a difference in that fight with the Hittites. So how Ramses was beaten at Kadesh in year five and found the resources to make a comeback in year eight with 10 times the army, 60,000 horsemen, legions of infantry, is explained in my first video at YouTube called Who is Richest Pharaoh Shishak? So you can find that story, how he managed to come up with 10 times the army in only three years. Now, the book, A Test of Time, you can get the full story and more in David Rule's Test of Time. He's the first to notice that Shoshank back to Israel's savior from the Arameans to Judah's plunderer of the temple, pushed the new kingdom back by 350 years too. So by pushing back Shoshank, it pushed back Ramses. Isn't that sad? What a coincidence that so much in the late Bronze Armana letters corresponds to the Bible stories of a united monarchy in the Iron Age. Or not a coincidence. I bet Roll is right. And the rest of the world's archaeological historians are all wrong. He, his book's been out for 20 years now. The odds of so many similarities, 350 years apart, being coincidences, are too high. So the ages have been misplaced. On June the 1st, two days ago, I received a paper, three days ago, a paper from academia.edu titled, Archaeology in the Biblical Narrative, The Case of the United Monarchy by Amihai Mazar. And his conclusion was, I would compare the potential achievements of David, successor to Saul, to those of an earlier hill country leader, namely Labayu, the Habiru leader from Sheshem, who managed during the 14th century to rule a vast territory of the central hill country and threaten cities like Megiddo in the north and Gezer in the south, despite the overrule of Canaan by the Egyptian new kingdom of Akhenaten the clown. So, then always noticing the similarity between Saul and Labayu, but they can't say it's the same because they've misplaced the ages by sticking Shoshank in the wrong place because his name sounds the same. And I didn't realize Ramashisha also sounded the same. So, anyway, that's neat how they keep noticing that gap. So, what a fluke this came out just a few days ago. So, I will bet $1,000 on the great Canadian gambler on Shishak being Shisha Ramses for short. So if you want to bet, all you got to do is comment on this video and then email me your name and uh, information so I know you're a real person at johntermel at yahoo.com and we'll have a bet. So that's it. I bet on role being right and the world being wrong.